let's come to ritual seven. And we're following the way in which three layers of traction are established existentially by ritual. And that this establishment, though it is characteristic of our species, goes back deeper and deeper into time, into almost geologic layers of not only life, but of the way in which physical elements themselves are made. And we're pursuing this not in some kind of a story or some kind of an ideational plan, nor in a collection of simply techniques that one could be trained to or could be instructed in. But there is a maturation that exceeds and precedes all of those techniques and aspects and one of the deepest of all of the layerings occurs in ritual action which establishes a sequence. And that sequence is capable, when it is completed, of having a completed set of actions which can be then woven with other completed sets of actions and so the first traction is the sequence that is completed. The second traction is the wovenness. And the third traction is that these woven layers that are brought together in our kind of species, Homo sapiens, sapiens, the weaving was usually archetypally for baskets or blankets. The weaving on a loom of um, clothing and blankets, the weaving of the grasses into baskets. The third traction is that of pottery, that of establishing a cycle, and that this ritual action not only makes the sequences complete so that you now have something objectively practical and something which is woven into figured shapes, but you have also the ability to have all of these woven elements brought into a cycle and it is the potter's wheel and the pottery that makes the cycle of ritual complete enough at that point to be able to then sustain the generated experience of culture that will come out of this. Part of the reason that we are learning in a completely new way is that we are here at the vanguard of a new species. Now our species originally, Homo sapiens, developed about 160,000 years ago in Africa and was there in Africa for more than 110,000 years before they left Africa. And the first place that they left Africa was not immediately across the um, bottom of the Red Sea into southern Arabia. But the place that they left was up along through the Nile, what became the Nile Valley. After a while, it was just a swamp 50,000 years ago a swampy area 
of a very verdant uh, Sahara grassland. And the first appearance of Homo sapiens outside of Africa was actually in what is today Israel and Palestine. And that dates back archaeologically, paleontologically, to about 47,000 years ago. Until that time, the most sophisticated species in the world outside of the Homo sapiens in Africa was Homer, Homo neanderthalus. And burial skeletons of Homo neanderthalus were found on the top of Mount Carmel dating back 200,000 years. And the curious thing is that the skeleton, the main skeleton found was outlined by little archaic bits of pollen, which meant that the body had been outlined by flowers at the moment of burial and internment. And so even Homo neanderthalus was able to figure the shape of uh, someone in their burial. When Homo sapiens came, Almost immediately you find that Homo neanderthal begins no longer to have traction in the landscape, in the world that they were, and they are displaced by the emergence of Homo sapiens, who by this time had evolved to a very special refinement of Homo sapiens, and so they are more properly called at this particular point about 40,000 years ago, they are called Homo sapiens sapiens. They double the term sapiens, which means not only wise man, but wise about being wise. Not only wise man, but wisdom man. So Homo sapiens sapiens are wisdom man. We live on the beginning of a cusp of about the next 500 years where the new species will be Homo sapiens stellaris, star wisdom man, a species that inhabits um, whole star systems. And not just being wise about being wise man, but being wise on the level of star systems in an interstellar range. The psychic precedent for this was already there 4,000 years ago. 4,000 years ago in Central Asia, where the rituals had come to a very special place, they had disclosed that Man's life on earth is not just to follow the pattern of the animals or to follow the pattern of the plants, but to follow the pattern of the stars. That the stars form not only constellations, but they form a sequence of constellations that when complete make a whole cycle which is large enough to contain a new scope for mankind and the rituals changed at that time. One of the very first developments at that time was the taming of the horse. And the taming of the horse took place in Central Asia. In Greek times they were called the Scythians. We would today identify them as uh, Northern Irene, and the sage at that time was Zarathustra, Zoroaster, Stargazer. And it enabled them not only with the horses being tamed, but to pair the horses together so that chariots for the first time began to be characteristic of them. And it allowed them with the horse and the chariots and the carts 
and being able to guide themselves by stars to have enormous caravan routes. Instead of just having contact with those within walking distance, a human being can train themselves. Uh, if one is athletic and yogic about it, I was able to work my way up in the prime of my uh, early 20s so I could hike 50 miles in one day. But generally, a, a normal average person cannot cover much more consistently than about uh, 15 miles a day. But with a horse, you can cover 100 miles a day very easily. And so the caravan routes began to be uh, stretched out and enormous, and about that same time, the development on sea coasts was that the ships began to be designed for longer and longer voyages. And so you had the beginning of enormous caravan routes that changed the way in which rituals now in their sequences were longer and more complex. The weaving of them became layered and much more complex and the cycling of them indeed became enormously complex so that by about 2500 BC, you began to have, for the very first time, not just cultures, and not just intercultural contacts, but you began to have civilizations. And the civilizations were not just city-centered, they were centered in a web of caravan routes that wove themselves together. And so you had certain sites that were very rare in the world of having certain products, able to have them exchanged and interchanged. And at the two ends of the great new European mass, there were two places that provided one of the rarest uh, metals that is available for mining, and that is tin. And the reason why <coughs> tin is so important, if you add the right amount of tin to copper, you're able to make bronze. And once you can make bronze, you now have a metal that will take an edge that is superior for the first time to um, the flint work of knives, of choppers, which had been in place for an incredibly long period of time. How long? Before Homo Neanderthal, there was a species called Homo erectus. And Homo erectus learned to flake choppers into scrapers and primordial knives two million years ago. But as Lewis Leakey uh, observed, once they had made a very sophisticated, Homo erectus had made a very sophisticated split flint chert spearhead, arrowhead, they made them exactly the same way for more than a million years. He said they made beautiful points stupidly. They never varied it. That the ritual for making them was kept intact for more than a million years. The whole import of this is that ritual has an existentiality which stains as deep as the material. It's not an overlay. It is deeply there. Deeper than this. And what we're trying to do, as you can see in our inquiry, we're trying to open and expand and take the blinders off because we're forerunners not only of a interstellar species, that is already here in small numbers indeed, 
but coming on very, very quickly and very strong. And we're trying to acclimate ourselves to a completely new context. And it requires a different method of learning. It requires a different layering of the past. And because it deals with the primordiality of nature in its transforms, which includes supernatural things like uh, telepathy, one can only do this if you layer in the phases that we're offering here, layer oneself to re-mature, to re-emerge, and the first primordial re-emergence is to come into existence again in a new way. The popular way of talking of it is to be born again, to be rebirthed. But the difficulty is that the original understanding of that 2,000 years ago was already a transform of what had appeared 2,000 years before that. The whole idea of transforming nature by a magi kind of a transform, a magi, magical transform, 2,000 years ago was transformed yet again into a double transform so that you had a three-layer quality rather than a two-layer quality, which would replace the one-layer quality of original unity. And so you went from unity to the tuning fork to the trident, <laughs> and these are three layers of maturing the three tractions of ritual. The first traction of ritual to establish sequences of objectivity is what nature does. The second, to be able to tune that, is to take nature and experience together as the sources so that what comes out of that is not just a existential objectivity, but is an essential integral of the existential. And that's the realm that we will get to at the end of our first year of symbols. The existential ritual actions come out of nature, but when they do, they generate the experience of the mythic horizon so that one doesn't just have emotions, but one now has feelings that can be raised to sentience. One doesn't just have figures, but one has configuration that is able to engender images which collect together in image sets, which weave together finally in an image base, and which cycles together in the imagination in the symbolic mind. And so you have this layering that occurs. And the entire mode of this whole ecology is one of integration which stresses figures that can be configured into focuses. The focus of a configured, completed ritual cycle will become an idea controlled by a synthesizing symbol. And it's true that one now can take one's symbolic ideas back to the rituals and reorganize them, reposition them, refigure them so that the configuration becomes more refined. And at this point, one doesn't have rituals, one now has ceremonies. We're not immediately talking about ceremonies, we're more immediately talking about the primordiality of nature and the primariness of ritual. 
because it's important for us to make this distinction and not quickly lose track of the way in which the fundamentals apply. Otherwise, we lose the practicality and we get into speculation. And the word speculation comes from the Latin speculum, which means mirror. Now, the mind can be shaped into a mirror, but if it is prematurely shaped into a mirror, what it reflects back is the ritual identity <laughs> of what you think and what you do, and they should match up. Whereas the true use of the mind as a mirror comes much later, many orders of transform later. Because in historical consciousness, the ground of that square of attention is a, not only a mind that has allowed for the permeability of vision to come through, but now serves in a kind of a diffracting way as a mirror as well. And so one of the classic, great classics that you get about a thousand years ago by the great Roger Bacon, one of the greatest uh, scientists of that whole era, uh, his sweet little book is called The Mirror of Alchemy. Seven little paragraphs that are just fantastically uh, precise. What is important for us is to keep cycling ourselves back into primariness and that that primariness emerges out of primordiality and not to leap to conclusions which are based on presuppositions. And the presuppositions are only fortified and they are indeed fortified and should be fortified by instruction and by training and by inculcation. But if you do that prematurely, you addict yourself to whatever the presuppositions in their premature integral uh, dictate. And this is one of the problems that is illuminated by Ruth Benedict and her great patterns of culture. She points out in 1934 after decades of work in not only anthropological work, but work on herself. She, as you recall from some of the previous presentations, she was a very wonderful poetess. Uh, she wrote poetry all her life. She was also an extraordinary uh, feminist. One of her uh, mentors, uh, Elsie Clues Parsons, was one of the most independent uh, genius women of the early 20th century, and Ruth Benedict's personal hero was Mary Wollstonecraft, whose vindication of the rights of women 200 years ago still stands, still in print all this time, and there are new editions all the time. She was an extraordinary figure, and I have three photos. This is a photo of the beautiful Ruth Benedict when she first realized that she could do something extraordinary. And here's a photo of her later in life in a sketch right at the end of her life by the great uh, psychologist Eric Erickson. 1948, she was 61 years old. Eric Erickson is uh, famous for taking the stages of life and taking exemplary persons to explicate the different stages of life. And uh, he used people like Martin Luther, like uh, Mahatma Gandhi, like Thomas Jefferson, in a series of books to show the life pattern by exemplars and what it looks like if you put the whole set together in a harmonic. That what a human being is, finally, is an enormously complex, many orders beyond the mind, of a conscious, spiritual array of possibility and not at all limited to an individuality. Not at all limited to a center of a circle. 
a focus of a square, the fulcrum of a triangle. For the mind, symbolically, these are satisfactory because these are ultimate integrals that bring everything to a single pointed focus. And a psychology that does this makes not only a me, but makes an I. <laughs> I am. But to stop at I am is to stop midstream and to forget that there is a bank that you came from and another bank that you're going to get to and you get swept away by the perspective of an ego that supposes that I am is the ultimate achievement in the universe and in fact calls nature by that word, universe. It's a one place and I am at the center of it whereas it is so scintillatingly differential as a cosmos, it is unlimited in its possibilities. It has boundlessness and infinities everywhere, and it's not just on the level of science, but on the level of art, one establishes that right away. There is no limit to the artistic genius of a spiritual person. And one of the ancient ways of proving this was the ability to have a spontaneous poem or a spontaneous drawing of a sinuous line to make a sketch of a portrait or to make the beginnings of a landscape. And it is this ability to spontaneously create on this personal level that shows the jewel-like quality which is not there in the individual. Because the jewel gets its insulation from all of the facets and not from the center of the crystal. <laughs> It gets it because its facets, if they are cut along the way creatively that they actually existentially exist, you can transform something which was just a very interesting looking crystal rock into a diamond. And so the ancient way in which one would talk a thousand years ago is that they ability to transform oneself out of the individuality into the spiritual person is the act of a diamond cutter. That one now does not just weave a blanket, but one is able to weave the coat of many colors, which becomes then the uh, covering of the bard the spiritual poet, the poet seer. And once one has that level of achievement, of refinement and transform for human beings, for the first time then civilization is possible. And it's made possible because art is expressed by an artist who has undergone that transform and can continually refine themselves by a process known as a critique. Or not just a critique by others, but a self-critique. An artist will know exactly when that work of art is finished, not because it is complete, but because it is to the place where it now can do its art work indefinitely. One of my favorite things decades ago was a uh, film I used to show when I was a professor of humanities in San Francisco. There was a film by the great uh, Mexican artist David de Siqueiros. And Siqueiros, to show his enormous energy, uh, made a museum of the March of Humanity 
in Latin America. He designed the building, he designed all the sculptures, he painted all the friezes, and so he made the entire complex. He used to wear a little hat and smoke cigars, and right at the end, where everything after years and years was in place, in the film, you see him at the moment. He takes the cigar out, he says, perfecto. <laughs> the work of art is not complete. It is open now to an infinity of appreciation. And it can be refined, not only because the artist goes back and refines it, it is refined in those who participate with it in their critique ability, which is attraction of their appreciability. And the critique is always on the basis of the ritual basis that engenders experience and the symbolic basis which engenders creative imagination. And so one works with these two together, and if you added a third level, and that is the historical, now you do not only have <coughs> that ritual basis that engenders the experience and the symbolic basis which engenders the creative, imaginative consciousness, but you have the artistic person who engenders the historical consciousness of it. And that historical consciousness allows for a third quality to come forth, and that is analysis, an analytic. And so the first transform is that it is able to be refined, not by redoing the work, but by redoing the interpretation on the basis of a critiquing. And the second, that one further transforms the critiquability and the appreciability of it by an even deeper, even wider analysis. And so science in this way is a larger harmonic of art, which is a transform of the whole integral cycle of nature, ritual, myth, and symbol. For us to have a new species, for us to have a interstellar civilization, we must now redo everything that we have done up until this point by going back and understanding, not only through superior analysis and superior critiquing and through superior transforming, but we have to be able to go back to the original emerging emergence and that's why ritual is still so uh, uh, terribly important. The patterns of culture gain their traction because they are generated by the way in which the figuration of ritual action happens. It's called pragmatic. And that pragmatic, that pragmatos, the thusness of action always founds itself somewhere in a locus. And when it does, it is now called practical. The action sequence is pragmatic, and when it is completed, now one has a completed practicum. This practicality is there and can be worked with. It can be trusted. Its objectivity will hold. It has a stability. And because it has a stability, the whole flow of experience can check its own stability in a precarious world by going back and reiterating the rituals. The rituals reconfirm our stability, that it is well-founded, that if we chip these flints in the right way, we will make a very usable spearhead. Um, Louis Leakey was the first man since Paleolithic times to learn how to make a perfect spearhead 
or a perfect arrowhead out of chipping rocks. And he could do it in about 30 seconds. You don't have to hem and haw and measure. You get the feel of it. And figuration in ritual is all about the body being very wise in feeling it in a sense way. So the sensorality of the body is the basis of sentience in feeling in experience. And the body can be emerged in such a way that it becomes not just sensitive, the right word is that it is sensorially alert. It's not just aware, but alert. In Los Angeles, there used to be a newsstand decades ago downtown, and the newsstand owner was blind. And he could make change in dollar bills because he could tell the difference in the feel of a $1 bill or a $5 bill or a 20 whatever it was. And you could stand there and watch this minute after minute for hours, and he did not make mistakes. And asking him one time, he said, a $1 bill will be very used. <laughs> And all the denominations up will have less. And you get the feel of it, of the texturality of it. I remember talking to an Eskimo artist in Canada from Nome, Alaska. This was in Calgary, Alberta, about 30 some years ago. And he said that there is a form of Eskimo sculpture that is not seen, but is only felt. It's kept in the parka, and one runs one's thumb over it. And that if you run your thumb over this little sculpture, you tune your alertness and sensitivity of your body so that you can feel where the game is. And you don't have to guess fruitlessly because you will die if you're not with them and know where they are. And the sensibility of that comes in this way. It is the same principle that jet pilots take a coin and run it through their fingers. They used to get that Eskimo hunter sensitivity because you cannot keep track of things at Mach 3 if you're waiting to see it before you respond. And so you have to have the feel for the aircraft. You have to have the feel for the hunt. And it is the body in its ritual comportment that establishes the traction for this. Without that, we leap right away to a speculation that is mental, that reaches back with such power that it muffles the whole existentiality. And this is the basis of then drying out life into an abstraction. Symbols do not need to be abstract at all. They can be scintillating. They can be scintillating to the point of being transparent and allowing the scintillation to go through into visions. Someone who is abstracted not only cannot have visions, they cannot have experience. And because they do not have experience, they cannot tell when they're in an artificiality. Except that nature doesn't cooperate for them. And they find at every turn that instead of there being the straight lines of identity, there are all these swirls. Because nature is not into straight lines, the mind is. Nature is into curves. She loves curves. And if the curves are given an integral, what the curves do is they weave into the basket. They weave into the blanket. And one can tell that here the weaving is happening before you. And as it does so, it creates the space within which experience now has a veracity which is based on a participation with nature. 
the field of nature outside the basket is the field of the space within it. The warp and the weave from the loom has a number of variants that one can learn. And as you learn them, you realize that fabric now becomes an extraordinary thing. One of the um, deepest of all of the figures who worked with anthropology was a woman named uh, Ruth uh, Bunzel. And Ruth Bunzel did a classic work, and we'll get to it after the break for just a moment, called the Pueblo Potter. And she was a secretary to Franz Boas. She was a lifelong friend of Ruth Benedict. She was the first one to be able to understand the feel of the pottery conveyed the entirety of the ritual traction that allowed for the culture to um, thrive. We'll come back after the break and take a further look at this. Thank you. Let's come back. We showed this last presentation last week, the cover of the Penguin edition of the One Volume Golden Bow. And this is a Maori chief from about 1880. The design is used on the 150th anniversary edition of Moby Dick. And as the frontispiece, in this little monograph, Lecture Notes in Physics, Time Harmonic Electromagnetic Fields in Chiral Media, published by Springer Verlag in Germany, Lecture Notes in Physics, and uh, published uh, here um, was about 1989. The vibratory tattoo has a chiral quality to it, not fractal, but chiral, which means that its iteration, unlike fractals, does not simply repeat, but expands and extends itself out. The Mandelbrot equation in fractals, x plus x squared plus 1 will yield an indefinite repeat of what it is into an infinity of smallness or largeness. It will be a reiteration of the set. But a chirality is a symmetry, a left-handed and right-handed symmetry that has the ability to generate itself out into an infinity of um, variants, variations. Um, another volume, Chiral Quark Dynamics, again published uh, by uh, Springer Verlag. This one a little bit later. Uh, this was published in 1995. There is an ability to be able to take fundamentals that are existentially real. They are not just true, but they are real. And one builds then the basis of what you do in the emergence spontaneously of not just a repeat of actions, but an iteration of activeness so that the sequences are just now fresh and emerged new and real. One of the great mysteries for so-called civilized people 
for city people, for mental people, for people addicted to abstractions, is to not have the feel of the ritual done right. And it isn't that the ritual is done right because it's done according to formula exactly the same way, but that what has emerged has just now emerged iteratively fresh. The success of a good ritual is that this objectivity is freshly new. And therefore, what we do with it is the first time that anyone has worked with this iteration of it. And so the wovenness of those ritual figure shapes out of it will be just recently done and will not be copies of something else. They will be literally themselves. And the mind, in its uh, habitual, integral assignment, says that they are representations of things. And this is not true at all. They are in themselves <coughs> objectively fresh and have their own reality so that the ritual figures live. They have the ability to be the basis, the traction of life. So that rituals are as deep as something like this. Just published uh, 2006. The RNA World, third edition, almost 800 pages, published by the Cold Spring Harbor Laboratory Press on Long Island. James Watson is the director and has been there for a long time. In fact, they reprint his uh, beautiful prologue to the first edition. He says, with the basic scheme for how RNA participates in protein synthesis, known, the path became open for definite experiments on the exact nature of the genetic code. Using enzymatically synthesized RNA as messengers for in vitro protein synthesis, the correct assignments for all of the triplet codons was determined by early 1966. And this is 40 years after that. What has occurred is that there is a subtitle, explicit, the RNA world, third edition, the nature of modern RNA suggests a prebiotic RNA world. Before there was a DNA world, there was an RNA world. And that carries back all the way to where we now are able to have volumes like this. This is by Niles Eldridge, one of the uh, authors of the book that was paired with Watson's Double Helix in Nature, um, the book on macroevolution, Niles Eldridge and Elizabeth uh, Verba. This one, uh, Eldridge and Joel Crawcraft, published by Columbia, 1980. Phylogenetic patterns and the evolutionary process. That the patterns that are noticed by Ruth Benedict go all the way back, not only into the evolution of life forms, but go back into the way in which materia itself is emerged and brought into uh, stability. All of this means that we are doing a recalibration. It isn't that rituals are done by primitive people because they don't know any better. It is not done simply to reproduce something that was done before. It is better to call these persons those who configure their experience on the primordial 
flow of nature that emerges original existence instantly that the sequence is completed. So that the traction, the first traction, is not only that a ritual sequence that is completed now has made this thread, but that that thread can be woven and that the weaving of it will make the baskets and blankets, metaphorically, that can be used now to sustain and generate our culture. An experience flow that not only flows with nature and participation, but firmly has traction upon the ritual basis, freshly done every time we do the rituals right. These baskets can be rewoven out of freshly made threads. In fact, the most sophisticated uh, uh, use of this kind of uh, uh, understanding of ritual was uh, made 2,500 years ago by the historical Buddha, who was one of the most masterful yogis that the planet will ever or any planet will ever expect us to host. The original monks were given a begging bowl and a needle. The begging bowl was the third traction, the pottery, to eat whatever is put in that bowl. The needle was for the weaving. And the weaving was in the form that the monks, every spring during the rainy season in India, would go to the cast off fabric bins and take scraps of thrown away fabric and their needle and sew together a new robe out of the fragments during the rainy season so that when it was over, they would go back out into the world with their new robe, freshly woven, which would carry the needle put into uh, usually the top fold of one's robe. And so the pottery of the third traction, the weaving of the second traction, and the first traction to do to be able to get the feel of doing a ritual completely all the way through was to be able to speak a sutra of the Buddha completely through flawlessly. Sutra in Sanskrit means thread. That if you could speak in the right rhythm completely all the way through, that sutra would then be freshly real and just for now the first time heard. Thus have I heard is the phrase that every sutra begins with because that's the way that you start the thread. Thus have I heard. Because it's the hearing that is the more primordial, more than sight, it is the hearing that is the basis of the way in which a sequence will be able to be detected that it flows all the way through. It takes a lot of discipline, geometrically schooled, to be able to see the completeness to the same level of refinement as being able to hear it. And not only does the Buddhist sutras all begin, thus have I heard, in the Vajrayana, uh, the word for um, uh, thus is uh, ivam, and uh, the character for ivam, the letter for it, is very much in Tibetan, like the very first moment of the re-emergence for the first time of this wisdom. And if one is able to hear it all the way through, if you have ears to hear, said Jesus, let them hear if you can hear it all the way through, it's like a piece of music that you have heard completely. You may not know the fugue 
form, but you can hear that it plays all the way through to its conclusion and the piece is now finished. It is finished in its ritual playing, but the experience engendered out of it has a vitality. It has a freshness. And so ritual lays the traction on three different levels so that it, our experience will be uh, lively, will be uh, alive. About the time that Ruth Benedict was putting together patterns of culture, for the very first time, a very sophisticated German philosopher of ideas work was being translated for the first time and articles for the first time being written uh, in the West. Uh, the man's name was Dilthe, Wilhelm Dilthe. He was born about 1833. He lived until about 1911. He was educated in Berlin and then he became a professor in uh, Basel, Baal, Switzerland. And then he went back to Berlin uh, and became the great professor there. In July 1925, the Philosophic Review had uh, an article on Delthi. And it's interesting because Ruth Benedict is one of the first people to be able to utilize some of the wisdom and ideas here from Delthi. And she recognized that what he was able to develop over many years, many decades, was an understanding of the importance that man in a very conscious way lives in a field of history and does not live in a field of myth. That cultures thrive in a field of myth and individuality is able to be integrated out of that but that man does not simply stop as the individual centers of a culture but are able to uh, transform themselves and go beyond and in fact go all the way into a historical consciousness. She writes on page 52 of the uh, patterns of culture in the chapter three, the integration of culture. In the social sciences, the importance of integration and configuration was stressed in the last generation by Wilhelm Delthi. His primary interest was in the great philosophies and interpretations of life. And he goes, she goes on to show that it is a deep quality of understanding that for life to be vital, it must base itself on the reality of existence and not initially upon the abstractions of mentality. If life is turned inside out, is turned upside down, it will trust for its traction then a mentality which is unable to give it a vitality. The vitality comes from the ground up, as it were, and not from the mind down. What comes from the mind down is a mentality rather than a vitality. And so it is the vibrance of the body in existential actions that brings the iteration of reality into existence freshly and for the first time. In the July 25th issue of the Philosophical Review, in which this article on Delthi that Ruth Benedict uh, read, uh, the first article is by John Dewey on value, objective reference, and criticism. And in 1925, just at the time that this was being brought out, the first edition of Experience in Nature was brought out by John Dewey. And this was 
written just as he was returning after teaching in China for a year. Actually, he was there a little more than a year. Uh, John and his wife, uh, uh, Evelyn, went to China in the early 1920s. And the professor who was there before him teaching in China was Bertrand Russell. And Bertrand Russell got very ill. Uh, Lord Russell was used to English food, and I think uh, Chinese food finally got to him. So John and Evelyn Dewey nursed Russell back to health. It took a couple of three weeks. And while this was happening, Dewey began to understand that China was a completely different philosophic environment and civilization. And so he immersed himself. He immersed himself into the Tao Te Ching, into the I Ching, into the Confucian classics. And so his book, Experience and Nature, is an American um, Taoist classic. He has a number of chapters, and they all have to do with experience, nature, or existence. Experience and philosophic method, existence as precarious and stable, nature, ends, and histories, nature, 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 existence, ex experience, existence. He writes, anthropologists have shown 1925, incontrovertibly the part played by the precarious aspect of the world in generating religion with its ceremonies, rites, cults, myths, magic, and it has shown the pervasive penetration of these affairs into morals, law, art, industry, beliefs and dispositions connected with them are the background out of which philosophy and secular morals slowly developed and he goes on to say, the life of early man is filled with expiations and propitiations. If in his feasts and festivals what is enjoyed is gratefully shared with his gods, it is not because a belief in supernatural powers created a need for expi expiatory, propitiatory, and communal offerings. Everything that man achieves and possesses and possesses is got by actions that may involve him in other or obnoxious consequences in addition to those wanted and enjoyed. His acts are trespasses upon the domain of the unknown. And hence atonement, if offered in season, may ward off dire consequences that haunt even the moment of prosperity or that haunt that moment. The rituals done right are not so much to protect as to ensure that the freshness is just now manifested. That this action which has been done not just by a single figure but done by the community of figures that go together to make this set complete. In American Indian stepping, the stepping is always in the same kind of progressive, rhythmic movement that walking would have, except that it is a walking not to go in a direction, but it is a taking of each step four times so that all four directions are done in this single step. One has covered the four directions at once in this stepping so that one stepping has a one, two, three, four set that each step then in that sequence will have that four directional composition. So the emergence then of that dance by that stepping, we'll have a emergent freshening that can be shared by the line of those that participate together in that ritual action. In the Blackfoot uh, sun dance, the Okan, the most uh, feared uh, society was the Itsuk 
Hawkinae, which is the Horns Society, uh, the Buffalo Horns, uh, meant that they were men who were empowered to kill, uh, to kill the game for the sustenance of the tribe, and if there had to be um, killing for the community, uh, they were the ones, they were the, uh, modern Hollywood would call them the hitmen, yeah. tough men. What's interesting about the Horn Society, the Itzkinae, is they had staves that were curled. And those curled staffs look for all the world like the croziers of bishops. But they're not the croziers of bishops. They were showing that this authority ends not in the point that I have the authority, but curls into the spiral which is the release back into the larger supernatural of the power that one has temporarily assumed for oneself to make certain actions done right. And the stepping not only is like in the four movements of each step, but that the gesturing ritually then is with the four fingers together, that one gestures in this way, one doesn't point one gives this kind of a gesturing and this kind of a stepping. It is for the completeness that every step in a sequence will have all of the dimensions of time and space, the four directions, as is said. And that those four directions now have, if one is centered, not a center point, but an axis. And that that axis has its extension into the earth and into the sky, into the heavens. So that one's posture of being upright in the stepping carries the axis of the zenith and of the uh, root in the earth. That one can bring any amount of lightning into the power of what one does and it is grounded in the earth so that you will not die and um, you will be able to convey that energy, not just into the earth, but to convey it into the activity of the sequencing of your actions so that the traction becomes ever, ever so much more powerful. And if someone does this comprehensively in this way, one gains the tunability to the access to tremendous power. Tremendous power. One of the most uh, powerful of all of the Navajo sand painters was named uh, Hosting Kla. And he was driving with a woman named Frank Newcomb. She and her husband ran the trading post on the <coughs> Navajo reservation just uh, over towards the New Mexico side of Arizona, not far from uh, Canyon de Chez. She was driving in a car with Hustin Claw uh, in the early 1930s, and a tornado spun out of the dark overcover, and wouldn't you know it, hit the highway, and because of the uh, heat of the highway, was following the highway directly towards their car. And about a quarter of a mile off, Hustin Claw got out of the car. This is on her own testimony. He walked over to the side of the road. He picked some sage, and he chewed it in his mouth with saliva, and he walked towards the tornado, and when it was about a half a city block away from him, he spat at it and it split into two. And the top part went whirling off to the side and the bottom part whirled off into the sand and uh, petered itself out. And he came back and quietly sat back in the car and uh, she drove them on. Frank Newcomb uh, has many books and uh, one of them is Sand Paintings of the Navajo Shooting Chant with Gladys uh, Reichardt. 
And we're going to use, when we get to myth, we're going to use Gladys Reichardt's Navajo Medicine Men sand paintings. Uh, Gladys Reichardt, like uh, Ruth Benedict, and like Ruth Bunzel, and a number of other talented women, all studied under Franz Boas in New York City. And Gladys Reichardt learned how to make Navajo rugs herself, how to weave, how to raise the sheep, how to shear the sheep, how to card the wool, how to spin it on the spindles and bring it together, how to get the minerals and the plants to make the colors, how to make the loom out of bits of uh, branch and out of thong, fine thong cords, and how to weave and make your own Navajo rug. And when they saw that she could do this, she was welcomed into the tribe. And they taught her so that she would know the complete gestalt of the entire cosmos of the Navajo people, the Dene is what they call themselves. And uh, out of her dozens of great works, the big two volumes, Navajo Symbolism is still in print and is one of the great classics in the world of someone who understood from the inside of why reality is made in this way and carries its energy all the way through into the development of visionary consciousness. We are taking our time because the laving and layering of what is being presented here needs to have its iterative cycling for it to be real. To pluck one thing out and to think that that's what's going on here is to be grossly mistaken on, many, on all orders on every single order that there is. For instance, if you'll notice, the center of the ritual phase has two women, Ruth Benedict and Jesse L. Weston. The center of the nature phase had two women, Mary Leakey and Jane Goodall. And when we get to myth, the pair of women is paired, so there'll be four women, but in a very special kind of a ratioing, the first group of pairs will be two women, Jane Ellen Harrison and the ancient uh, original poet, Anna Duana, from 4,400 years ago. Then Gladys Reichard's Navajo medicine men, but paired with that will be in the third place, Suzanne Langer's Philosophy in a New Key with a pair of men in between, J.R.R. Tolkien's version of Sir Gawain and the Green Knight and Plato's dialogue, The Phaedrus. So that you begin to get that there are ratioings and relationships. And just like uh, the end of myth will be the interval of a pair of the greatest Chinese poets, Li Po and Tu Fu, that echo the interval one, which was Lao Tzu's Tao Te Ching, and in between the Tao Te Ching and Li Po and Tu Fu is um, the Buddha's uh, marvelous uh, sutra, the Satipatthana Sutra, the Mindfulness Sutra, in both of its renditions. The shorter one that's in the Majjhima Nikaya and the longer one that's in the Diga Nikaya Why is it that there is a greater and a lesser? It's because when you teach the memnonic, it's very difficult for someone who's trying to learn not just this sutra, but having to learn hundreds of sutras to memorize them all. And so one learns to memorize the lesser one first and then the greater one as an expansion of that later. And it teaches you how to expand this and do this. This is the ancient technique by using the memory in the mind to remember not the written language but what you have heard, 
the oral language. And the only way to remember it, because it's not based on visuality, it's based on an audio hearing, one has to be able to hear it in its flow so that all of the images that one is saying flow in the same stream and that the uh, language keeps that flow so that all of those images move together like all of the electrons working together to keep an electric current going and that the feeling tone then is the relationality of the amperage of the oral language and the connectivity of the images into sets and an image base so that the feeling that comes out of it then is a configuration. And if feeling configures, life is not only vibrant, but is real. That configuration cannot be falsified. There's all the difference in the cosmos between something that, as E.E. E. Cummings once spoofed in one of his great little short poems, he said, it comes out flat like a ribbon and lies dead on the brush. It's just toothpaste. You can't live on it. But something that is done with a veracity of ritual traction on its three levels done right has this quality where one's experience has that vivacious veracity that now the mind that integrates from that mysterious flow will have a pristine quality. Its centeredness will not stop with itself but will open into the transparency of the open mind. Towards the end of the lives of two of the most profound people of the middle of the 20th century, Niels Bohr and J. Robert Oppenheimer, both did little books called The Open Mind. They both said, now that we have atomic energy and weapons, there is no alternative to the open mind for man if he is to survive. But the open mind on scale of billions of persons is going to be the threshold out of which that new species will come. Because that open mind opens itself not to a mutation, but to a transformation of the species itself. This is what we're doing here. It takes a while to do this. Not only are we doing the presentations, but if you're working the course, if you're doing the ritual right, you're reading the notes of the previous phase in tandem. This is Ritual 7. You're reading the notes of Nature 7 at the same time. So that when you're looking at this, you're now reading notes to do with Mary Leakey and Jane Goodall, with chimpanzees whose culture goes back 70 million years, and with Mary Leakey's concerns with species that were here before the genus Homo was even risen millions of years ago, at the same time that we're taking a look at Ruth Benedict and Jesse L. Weston. We're going to get deeper into both of them next week. I want to bring out something that's very important here that we began today with talking about the origins of civilization and how it is so easy for the abstracted mind to misunderstand, to misunderstand life, to un misunderstand veracity, and to misunderstand what reality is completely and never know. Mithras slaying the bull. For hundreds of years in the later Roman Empire, Mithraism was the most powerful religion that there was, not Christianity, not the old Greek mythology. 
But this is The Mysteries of Mithra by the great Belgian savant Franz Cumont, who was a friend of Jesse L. Weston's and who influenced heavily uh, from Ritual to Romance. Cumont shows very clearly here, this has a, this is a bull is Toro, Taurus, a Taro Noctis Mithra, a marble group from the second century in the British Museum. Where the knife is striking the bull, it is not blood that is coming out, but it is three sheaves of grain. Kumant writes, the remarkable feature of this group is that not blood, but three spikes of wheat, bread wheat, issue from the wound of the bull. According to the Mithraic theory, wheat and the vine, bread and wine, sprang from the spinal cord and the blood of the sacrificed animal. It is the spinal cord which is the cable of all the threads of the neural capacity. And in yoga, of course, the two kundalini paths that go up through it, so that the whole ecology of its upright stance is not to have good posture, but to have the axis of the condensing of it, and that the condensing of it is from the cloud of unknowing into the roots of the below the horizon, the netherworld the original way of keeping track of that was not through the zodiac of the equatorial disk, but through the other cycle that runs perpendicular to it. And for Zoroaster, for Zarathustra, he was the originating sage for that huge, different perpendicular cycle. That cycle is not the zodiac, but is the Milky Way. In China, like anywhere else, where the Milky Way is taken, the spiral cycle is not a circle with a center, but is an unfoldingness of the entire dynamic spread and distributed throughout its total field. And the starting point of that was always where the North Star has a perpendicular closest to the horizon of the Earth at midwinter. And at that point, the Chinese say the Milky Way is like the great celestial dragon. They go for fire. The West has always gone for milk. At Glastonbury uh, Cathedral and the ruins, there is a stone frieze of St. Bridget, who was a great Irish uh, sage, a friend and companion of St. Patrick. Both of them are buried at Glastonbury. And it shows St. Bridget milking a cow. It is the milk of that celestial cow. She used to be called Hathor in Egypt, like Hera. Whenever there was like a female Pharaoh, like Hatshepsut, she was always given the look not only of the celestial Hathor, but her face had that kind of a feline, almost cat-like, lapping of the milk kind of quality. And what it shows is that the Milky Way then is a another orientation that when is brought into juxtaposition with the zodiacal, the sun and the moon are no longer the arbiters of how the energy integrates, but they're only one vector in a pair of vectors that make not just a right angle, but a right angle that is movable and mobile around the pivot. The Chinese phrase was the pivot of the four quarters. We're going to come back to this deeper next week.
we're going to go deeper into the way in which Jesse L. Weston and Ruth Benedict of this generation of genius wise women brought out more and more the qualities that the male dominated scholarship of the universities had consistently missed. They, like some over-refined Baroque group, drew and drew and drew until there were no open spaces. Because it was the primordial open spaces that counted as much as what was put there. And this is one of the things that Ruth Bunzel found out in the Pueblo Potter, that the original Zuni pottery had a lot of open spaces. And all of a sudden, later on, with Akama, there were no more open spaces. And the potters could no longer tell Ruth about the individual items in the composition. They said each one is whole and cannot be taken apart. Whereas the original Zuni pottery was that the pot makers all understood what every single individual speck and the spaces were. More next week.